Hello, all you Miata enthusiasts out there in the internet world. This is Keith Tanner here, coming to you live from my home shop, because of course none of us are going to work right now, except for our shipping department. And uh, today I'm going to be giving you a tour of Indy. Indy is our ND V8. And uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a tour as to um, what it's like to drive, how it's specified, but this is the intent of this is to be a hardcore technical dive into this car. There's lots of videos out there, there's lots of reviews of this car online from, uh, from videos from Drive Tribe, from Top Gear Magazine, Road and Track, Automobile, Car and Driver, Motor Magazine in Australia has reviewed this thing, everybody's had a chance at this car. So there are lots of driving experiences out there, but I'm going to give you a good tour on what's actually under the hood, literally, and underneath the car, and we'll talk about how we made this thing happen, not just, not just what it's like to drive. So I'm going to start off, this is an important one, I even took notes for this, I'm going to start off talking about this particular car. Um, Fly Miata, we knew when the ND was coming, uh, we knew we'd need multiple cars, uh, and so we planned to buy two of them right off the bat. And this particular car was actually on the very first boat um, that arrived in the U.S. With, uh, with ND Miatas. It came on the boat with all of the launch editions. We weren't allowed to take delivery of this, and the launch edition guys got it. But um, this car is one of the very first ND Miatas to hit the shores here. Uh, we got it in August 2015. In January 2016, we tore out the engine so that we could, uh, we could do this to it. And then um, in August 2016, we had it on the track. So, Flying Miatas used to be known primarily as a forced induction shop. For years, that's what, how we were known. It was all about the turbos. Uh, we did our first LS swap in 2008 uh, on, our, on our shop car called Elvis and started doing it for customers at that point. Um, we did NAs, NBs. When the NC came out, we built a car called Atomic Betty uh, and then started doing NC swaps for customers as well. And we knew from the start we were going to have to do NDs um, because even though we still put a lot of effort into the force induction stuff, the V8s were becoming very well known. Um, we also took the opportunity with the ND, for the previous three generations, we, um, the first three generations we worked with our partners at V8 Roadsters uh, for the swap kits. They provided the, the engine mounting hardware, uh, the transmission mounting hardware. Uh, we worked with them on sorting out some of the problems. This is the first one that we did from scratch at Flying Meadows. This is this was uh, from the ground up a Fly Miata car. And we took the opportunity to fix a number of things about the earlier cars that we weren't completely happy with, um, things that we'd learned on the earlier cars. And so this basically was a pure development car to say, let's, what is the best LS3 car we can build? Um, we also, we built this car when we started building it in 20, 2016, we built it with reproduction in mind. It wasn't a matter of just, let's see if we can cut and weld and get this thing running. Um, the goal was to actually design and build a car that could be reproduced by anybody at home or reproduced by ourselves so we could build them for customers and so the customers could buy parts and build them themselves. So this car from the start, you'll see a lot of prototype parts on this car, but they were prototypes designed to be reproducible. Um, I'm going to answer some of the questions that we got online first about the, about the feel of the car, what it's like, some specs. Um, the NAs and NBs, I'll give you the feel one right away. Uh, the NAs and MBs, when you're driving one of these LS cars, you can never get away from the fact that you're sharing a small car with a big engine. It's, uh, it's like a pod racer. You just kind of strap a couple of seats to the side of an enormous engine, and there you go. Um, huge fun for that, but you never get a chance for the engine to fade into the background. Uh, on the NC, it's got more of a grand touring vibe. The engine's a little less front and center. Um, the car is bigger, it's more comfortable, but it doesn't have the same agility, I guess, the same. Uh, the same urge to turn as the uh, as the first couple of generations do. This one combines the best of all worlds. Uh, this is a real world car. I have done thousand mile days in this car, um, but the first time I had it on track, I was throwing it around like it was my NA Target Miata that you saw a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's got the the ferocity and the um, and the agility of the NAs and MBs, but it's got the grand, grand touring chops of the NC. So. As you would hope from the newest and latest and greatest, it is, I think, the best of the bunch. There are some at Fly Miata who prefer the pure GT feel of the NC. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I like my V8 cars to be a little crazier, and so this one's a little crazier. Uh, speaking of crazy, the engine we put in this car, I'll talk about that one in a little bit. Um, 
So specifications, this car is 2,600 pounds. Uh, stock, it was 20, just about exactly 23, 23 and change. Um, it has 53% of its weight on the front wheels, and that changes whether the top's up or down. Um, but as it sits right now, it's 53% front, 47% rear. Factory, it's about 51%. Um, these cars are not actually 50-50 from the factory, despite what the ads tell you. Uh, the RF with the top up is pretty darn close. And one of these uh, with a V8 with the top up and an RF would be something like 52%. So it's, it's, it's still very manageable front weight. That's always the big concern people have with this. Um, a lot of the weight gain actually comes from the transmission. Uh, performance wise, when the car and driver did instrumented testing, uh, exactly as it sits right here, we didn't do anything to set it up. We just drove it in and say, okay guys, have fun. Um, they clocked a 3.5 second 0 to 60 time and 11.7 quarter 123 and that was on an unprepared surface that's just that was the high speed testing part of the Hyundai proving grounds in Mojave of all things um, it pulled 1.07 g on the skid pad and it did a 0 to 150 mile an hour time of 18.7 seconds uh, they were also testing a 911 that same day and this thing was coming off the line harder than the 911 so despite the fact that it's front engine rear wheel drive it still has a lot of traction um, one of the questions we get, well, I'll get to that in a moment. So, that's uh, I think what I'm going to uh, I'm going to start with. And of course, speaking of starting, we can't run this thing without making a little bit of noise. So, before I start popping the hood, let's make a little noise. You can always tell when someone's giving a tour of the shop because you can hear Indy fire up. Everybody who comes for a tour wants to hear that noise. And you might have noticed that it started off a little bit quiet and then it got loud. That was me playing with the active exhaust. And I'll give a tour of that, a very specific tour of that in a couple minutes. Okay. Let's talk about this thing. Make sure I don't... I'm not missing any questions. I'm not. Okay, here's the heart of the beast. That is an LS3 520, LS376 525 crate engine. Um, they are exact, that's exactly what it sounds like. It comes from GM in a crate. Uh, it has a two year warranty. And uh, this particular engine is basically a stock LS3 with a cam that came out of the ASA stock car racing series. Um, it's a cam that has a great idle to it. It's got ferocious mid-range snap. It's got the, a mid-range throttle response like you would not believe. Um, it can, takes a little bit of tuning to get it happy at part throttle, um, part throttle behavior, but it's got a madness to it that uh, we had a lot of discussion about what engine to put in this specific car because we knew a lot of journalists would drive it. Um, this is the one I, I campaigned for. It's the same one that's in my uh, the same one that's in my Targa Miata, and um, huge fun. Uh, we have a question about Massachusetts compliance. Um, Massachusetts does not have any specific compliant requirement that I'm aware of. Uh, you may have to ask other people in Massachusetts, but um, whatever engine swaps are allowed to do. So. That's an LS376 525, rated at 525 horsepower. In reality, they don't make quite that much. Uh, this car is somewhere around 450 at the wheels, which is pretty healthy. Uh, it also makes 400 foot-pounds of torque from 1800 RPM to redline or so. So it's a very usable powertrain. Uh, it's attached to a Tremec T56 Magnum transmission in the back end. Um, the differential is out of a, in this car, it's a Camaro AAM differential out of, I think, the Alpha platform um, with custom half shaft, custom drive shafts. Uh, and pretty much everything else is custom on this car. Um, the intake, we did have one question about why we use this intake instead of the cold air one that we used on the earlier cars, and the matter on that one is simply packaging. 
We spent a lot of time on packaging on this car. The very first thing we did was we took our plastic test fit engine, dropped the car on top of it, and then started moving things around by half an inch in every direction, trying to see what would fit best. Uh, it's a very, very tight fit in here, as you can imagine. This is not a, uh, this is not a big car, um, so we had to do a lot of work to make it fit. Uh, one nice thing we were able to do with this, uh, this intake system, as you can see right here, we were able to put the stock ECU, that's the, um, the GM ECU, into a, uh, into a shielded area so it's actually not getting as hot as it could uh, with all the underhood heat. Radiator on these cars is hard to see. It is a custom radiator for this application. Um, it's based on the one that we build for the four cylinders, but it has different, uh, different layout in terms of where all the, the inlets and outlets are. It's got a fitting for the steam vent, that kind of thing. Uh, question about if, it, if it's nose heavy, that's what everyone always wants to know. The answer is basically no. Um, it's got about the same front weight as a Mazda Speed Miata does. Uh, it's 53% on the front wheels. That is not nose heavy at all, and honestly, you'll never notice it. So let's take a quick look around here. Uh, this car was built a little bit differently than some of the others. Um, on the later builds that we did, the GM fuse box is here, I think. That might be in the other corner, but we kept the GM fuse box. On this car, we amputated it. It was a lot of work, uh, added some extra potential failure points. We took it away. This is the factory master cylinder, but we did have to change the slave cylinder. The slave cylinder in these cars is plastic from the factory of all things, and we needed a different size, so we engineered, Brandon Fitch, our, our resident engineer, I don't know if you can see it, drew up a special adapter that allows us to put a Willwood master cylinder on there. And, uh, and that gives us the ability to run the big T56 transmission without, uh, with a factory pedal, without having to change the pedal. This particular pad right here, this, this uh, plate, is really just there to hide the fact that there's a void in the firewall. It's there for the factory high pressure fuel pump for the direct injection setup. Um, it makes it look as if the engine can go further back. It can't. Uh, and also there's some wiring back there, so we just decided to hide it and use it for a little bit of advertising because, you know, why not? Uh, this is, I believe, in the later cars. This is what I believe in the later cars. Uh, we, put the, we put the fuse box, the GM fuse box there. So this, this engine comes with a full wiring harness. Everything's labeled, as you can see. Right there, that is the map. Um, everything's labeled. It comes with that warranty. It's a, uh, it's a very easy thing very easy thing to build. GM is very, very supportive of people doing crazy stuff with their cars. So that's what it looks like under the hood. Um, yeah, engine, big engine. At the wheels, we went for the biggest Willwood brake kit available. Um, it's a six piston front kit with 12.9 inch rotors, uh, spec 37 alloy. It's, a, it's been a very reliable setup. We've not had any brake problems with the car at all. We do have them fed, I will show you this later, we have them fed with some um, various brake ducts and the wheels are 17 by 9 6 ULs and we usually run a Bridgestone RE71R in a 245 4017. Um, it's actually proven to be a pretty good setup. Every journalist that drives this car, of course, does burnouts in it, so we've gone through a lot of tires, but most of that has been to due to hooliganism and not so much because of the car's innate uh, appetites. So the interior of the car looks stuck. You honestly can't tell. Uh, but the only thing that we did was we covered up, whoops, there we go. We covered up the shift pattern on the factory shift lever and added a, uh, <laughs> added a separate little plate. Um, that's because it's easy to remember the T56 has a different shift pattern than the factory does. But otherwise, it's completely untouched. There's, uh, we added a roll bar, obviously but there's no way to tell what's been done. We'll show you something else as well. Let me just pop this open. Part of our, uh, part of our gain, part of our attempts to keep the weight distribution under control was we put the battery in the trunk um, along with a kill switch because, you know, R&D cars is always good to have the ability to shut things off. But this allowed us to uh, move a chunk of weight back to the trunk where it belongs in a Miata. And, uh, and gave us some extra room for the engine. And of course, Tom and Tano signed the car. 
At the back, you can't see it very well. We'll get underneath here in a minute, but we have this dual center exhaust. We get a lot of people asking for this exhaust, um, if they can put it in their four cylinder cars. We designed it specifically for the eights and you'll see what the, uh, what the reasoning is there when I get the car up in the air. So let's do that, shall we? I'm going to warn you, uh, this car on its last trip, last press trip, we happened to go past Bonneville during Speed Week. And you know, you can't just drive past Speed Week. That's just not, it's not allowed. So we stopped, we went out in the salt and um, <laughs> we went out on the salt. It's a little crusty underneath here. We hosed this thing off like you would not believe, spent a lot of time hosing it down. Um, but then it's been sitting for, well, as you can imagine, a month and a half or so. Uh, so I'm going to warn you ahead of time, there's a little bit of surface crust on some of this. Car goes up. You know, one of these days I'm going to put a, uh, I'm going to put a reservoir of high pressure hydraulic fluid underneath this thing so I can just slam the car up in the air. So there is the underside. This is the part I actually love showing off to people because I'm really proud of how this, show, this uh, turned out. But this is what we ended up doing underneath. Um, again, I apologize for the crust. Uh, this is a left, this is hangover from, uh, from Bonneville. Wow. We hit this thing with high pressure several times. Bonneville is hard to clean off. Um, you will notice we have heat shielding all over the place. Uh, we, one of the things that we did with this car is we kept the factory front subframe. Um, that's because the factory front subframes are pretty well designed. They're strong. Uh, they don't have the flex problems that some of the tubular ones do. Um, you know, I always think that tubular is better, but it turns out that very well engineered, um, very well engineered stamped steel can be more effective. So that was one of the big goals was to keep the front subframe. Um, probably should have taken off some of the panels down here because what we also did is we changed out the steering rack. We needed the steering rack space, uh, the, the factory electric power steering, we needed that space for the V8 engine. So we converted to a classic manual rack, which means, well, you can't see it very well up here, but we built new brackets on here. These are hand-built uh, prototypes built some new brackets for that and, uh, and hung a classic manual rack, or not manual rack, hydraulic rack down there. We also have what, off, what we often call the spider brace down here. This is a replacement for a bunch of the factory bracing that's down here. Um, it actually, when car and driver tested the car, they asked if it was stiffer than stock because it really does tighten up the chassis down here. We designed this after I watched an episode of Project Binky this was done with cardboard aided design. Uh, we literally took, took some tape, drew out all of, the, uh, all of the forces we wanted to control, all of the lines we wanted to do, put a box where the, uh, where the transmission mount was gonna be, and then when that was figured out, modeled it in CAD. All of these parts are, uh, the production ones are a little bit cleaner, but um, they are all built for us uh, on laser, out of laser cut stainless steel, or laser cut steel, um, so they can be easily rebuilt and you can just bolt one of these on. Back here is the transmission, or the differential. Um, this is, we've used ones out of both uh, Pontiac G8s and this one is out of a Camaro, very similar related cars. Uh, we went to a lot of effort to make sure that the differential could be removed without having to pull the whole subframe. Um, this is again a prototype. 
but uh, you can see this front plate is bolted on, so it can be uh, it can be removed. Um, there's reinforcements at the back as well. We we added reinforcements. Oh, there we go. You can't see it very well. Added reinforcements for the rear, um, and then there's this big crossbar in front of the exhaust that is used to not only mount the front of the transmission, the uh, differential, but is also crucial to keeping that subframe together. Uh, on the NCs in particular, the V8 cars put a lot of force. The acceleration force comes in here on the, basically this forward trailing arm and uh, we'll take the subframes apart. So we wanted to make sure that wouldn't happen. This car has burned off multiple sets of tires, has seen countless track use with journalists, which is the worst kind of track use, and uh, has not shown any signs of damage or problems with that whatsoever. So big, uh, big plus. It is a little tight down here. Um, this is a small car and someone put a big engine in it. And here is the exhaust system. This actually had some very nice symmetry to it. We're very happy with how this turned out. Um, the center exhaust was determined by packaging, trying to find a true dual that we could run that would, uh, that would allow us to get the mufflers we needed under the car. And we wanted to have a sound that you could drive all day long. But then we realized with this packaging that if we put a butterfly in here, we could bypass the mufflers completely. And so that's what our active exhaust is. There's some butterflies in, that, in those, uh, right in here. Again, Bonneville crust. Um, those butterflies allow the exhaust to completely bypass the mufflers and make an enormous amount of noise. And uh, it's silly fun, but it lets you, lets you play the engine like a musical instrument. Enormous, enormous fun to do. Hit me with questions, folks. I'm here to answer questions. I work best when I'm answering questions. So uh, on the rear of the car for brakes, we've got our, the rear half of our little big brake kit. Uh, this car has been worked very hard at just about every track we've taken it to. Never had any brake problems, with the exception of ABS, and I'll get, that one, get to that in a moment. Uh, that's our Fox Racing suspension in there, of course. Um, it's the exact same Fox Racing suspension that we sell for the other cars, with the exception of special spring rates for the V8 because of its slightly different waste distribution and because of its ability to do very dramatic things. Uh, this long travel suspension is an important part for why the car works the way it does. Um, all the journalists who have driven it have been really impressed with the suspension. You can see that in the reviews. And a large part of that is due to the fact that we didn't cut down on the amount of suspension available, the amount of travel available. These shocks have seven inches, I think, of shaft travel, which allows this car to have the travel it needs to be able to absorb mid-corner bumps, to be able to drive like a normal car. The best thing that journalists, the best uh, compliment that journalists ever give us when we're driving these cars is that it feels like a factory job. And part of that is the fact that suspension is not terribly compromised. Um, again, it's all about travel. It's all about sensible spring rates. Um, it's all about allowing the suspension to move. You know what, I'm gonna pull these wheels off so we can have a look in the wheel wells, okay? Let's do that. First you put on the gloves. Otherwise I'll end up with brake dust all over my hands. Come on. Hmm. Get a sticky lug now. I'm gonna say these lug nuts have been off a few times. We get a lot of questions on how to fit 245s on these cars. And one of the things we did with this particular car was we took off the springs, fully compressed the suspension all the way up, and then with the wheel on there, moved it around, made sure we had clearance for everything. There we go. Tires are a 245. Uh, there's a question here about the sway bars, and the sway bar is a custom piece. Uh, this particular one is a prototype. Huh. 
Looks like we need to do a little work on the brake ducting. Um, the sway bar mount is on the subframe on these cars. Can't really get a good shot of it. Go on, let's have a look. And so we had to, when we moved the steering rack, we had to move the sway bar mount. So this is a custom sway bar built for these cars, or for these cars, meaning these V8 NDs specifically. Uh, the rear sway bar is, is factory, or is the same as the four-cylinder cars, but this is a, this is a special one that we built. Um, as you can see, the 245s, uh, you may not be able to see, have required a little bit of rolling, a little bit of work. In the back, we also uh, we moved the rear brake line, which is something we recommend for anybody with big, with big tires. We'll take a peek in here. We can see the, the new steering column. That is a special adapter that allows us to convert from GM spline count to Miata spline count. And there we go, there's some of the car up in the air. Put this down. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit actually about the can system, and this is the part that gave us the most trouble with, uh, with building this car. We had the usual sort of trouble. Um, I exploded a carbon fiber drive shaft pretty much immediately. Uh, the first weekend, I think, that we had it on the road. Um, I think we overheated it. I think it got too hot with our exhaust around it. You don't get any real heat in the transmission tunnel in this car, but there's enough heat trapped in there. I think we overheated the epoxy and the thing just sheared itself. Uh, one big plus for carbon fiber drive shafts. They take out some of the shutter for the engine. It, it actually makes for smoother drivability, but also when they break, they don't destroy anything. Now this thing runs an aluminum drive shaft, hasn't a problem since. But, so there were, there were little adventures like that. Uh, we lost a power steering pump which is a you know, new GM part, but it went down, it took the rack with it. I was changing, uh, changing car steering parts in a, in a parking lot of, um, <laughs> parking lot of a hotel in Lancaster, California. There's probably still a stain in the, in the parking lot there. Um, oh, we have a question here about the sway bar setup. Since I was talking about sway bars, I'll get to that. The car is set up to be neutral. Um, you know, this car can obviously oversteer anytime you want to, depending how you drive it. Uh, but it is set up so that steady state cornering, it is a fairly neutral setting which makes it easy to control on the throttle, which is how it should be. That's how a Miata should be. This just has more throttle. This just has more throttle than the other, uh, than other Miatas do. So the biggest, I'll get behind the camera because you guys can hear me back there. Um, if this is better, let me know. Give me a thumbs up or, or tell me in the comments. Um, the biggest challenge we had in this whole thing was integrating the electronics. Uh, the ND is a very complicated car from a, uh, a digital standpoint. Um, you would not believe the number of things that have to talk to each other just to start the car. And of course, you know, the, the, di the traction control system talks to the stock computer, the, the engine control system which talks to the body control module. The reverse lights put the, put the car in reverse, which tells the powertrain control module the car is in reverse, which tells the body control, control uh, module the car is in reverse, which tells the electrical switching module the car in reverse, which turns on the reverse lights. That's how much work it involves just making the reverse lights come on. So we spent a lot of time, as you can imagine, yanking out the engine, yanking out the uh, steering rack. That really pissed off the entire system. Uh, we worked with a company called MRS Electronics, uh, particularly a fellow, um, a fellow named Colin Beck. He put a lot of his own time into it. He worked very well with us. Unfortunately, no longer at, uh, at MRS, but we really appreciate Colin's help. And we spent a lot of time data logging all of the CAN systems, the CAN chatter in this car, in several stock NDs. Uh, Colin actually bought one of his own. He says it wasn't for, for data logging, but that's a good excuse. Um, and spent hours, hundreds of hours, pouring over data logs, graphing things out, trying to find out what happens when you push the cruise button, the cruise set button, what's the signal in the, uh, in the CAN system that does that? What's the system that says the engine is running? What's the system that says the outside temperature is such and such? Where's the communication between the body control module and the uh, powertrain control module? What does that look like? Because we had taken out the powertrain control module. So this, this gateway that we have with, uh, from MRS Electronics, um, it allows us to block some CAN signals, it allows us to inject our own CAN signals, and allows us to let some straight through. Uh, we have to do things like translate the fuel economy signal from the GM computer. We have to translate in, that into Mazda's numbers, and we had to 
reverse engineer what Mazda's numbers were because it's something ridiculous like, oh, what is it? It's uh, it's a ping. It pings every time it uses a certain amount of fuel, um, and the the quant and the GM works like that too. But it pings at a different frequency with a different um, different amount of fuel, or even just getting reverse lights going was tricky enough for telling the, the start start the start stop system that the car was running. Um, we got almost all of it running. The one thing we don't have at the moment, and I think I know how to do this, I just haven't spent the programming time to do it, is get the steering rack signal completely simulated. And that means that the, um, the, trash contr the stability control system is not yet online. Our solution to stability control is we give you lots and lots of mechanical grip, we give you lots and lots of suspension travel for a forgiving chassis, and we give you a wide amount of torque with a very controllable throttle. So we give you a very easy car to control. So instead of depending on electronics to make it controllable, what we do is we give you the easiest possible car to drive and then let you drive it. Um, you don't buy a car like this because you want a Tesla. You want a car like this because it makes awesome noises. Um, you want a car like this because it's a Cobra with the top goes up and it's air conditioning and you can drive cross country and, uh, and it makes all sorts of crazy noises. Um, question from Michael Lindman, does the dash give an accurate miles per gallon reading? And it does. Uh, it took a little while to get to that point because we had a lot of very interesting math to do there, but we did figure out how to get the dashboard to give accurate miles per gallon. And fun fact about the ND, the, um, the fuel gauge doesn't work just on a float. You'd think that that was a problem that was solved, but Mazda decided to make it more complicated. The fuel gauge goes by dead reckoning. It uh, When you fill up the car, when it sees the the amount of fuel change over a certain amount of time, you will see that the um, it will set the fuel level, and then it goes off instantaneous con uh, consumption. So as the car uses fuel, it basically says, well, we should have about three gallons left, so let's bring this down, which meant that if we didn't have an accurate miles per gallon signal, the fuel gauge was inaccurate. And I gotta tell you, I might have maybe run out of gas a couple of times before we figured that one out. You're cruising along the road, you've got three quarters of a tank, and the car goes Bleh. You don't immediately think it's out of fuel, but it's out of fuel. Um, so yes, the fuel the fuel gauge thing does work. Uh, a couple of things about driving this car as a regular everyday car. All of the internal systems, the automatic HVAC works beautifully, for example. The infotainment system is untouched, so all the Bluetooth, the CarPlay, all that sort of thing still works. Um, the fuel economy still works, and the fuel economy on this thing, on the highway, uh, we did a road trip with a 1.8 stage one turbo Miata. Uh, and then a uh, Travis and I took that thing down to California and we were on the road we were within 10% of each other I think on miles per gallon it was maybe less than that uh, this thing was in the uh, was in the 30s um, during the road around town it's pretty tragic um, around town these engines basically will will eat a certain amount of gallons per hour as they're sitting there idling uh, so if you're going 13 miles an hour you're still gonna suck down those all those gallons so the faster you go, the more efficient they are. So, officer, I was trying to save fuel, what can I say? Um, so yeah, around town, you can see single digit stuff sometimes if you're really just kind of stop and go. But when you're on the highway, it's in the 30s, which is pretty healthy. Let me check my notes. Notes. What do people ask? The active exhaust. That's something else that came out of our CAN system. So, because we were in the CAN system, because we had the ability to read all the messages were in there and do something with them, we decided to make the exhaust controllable. And what we did is we took the wiper stock. Uh, it's got the, well, I'll show you. Let's, let's bring this car down and then I'll show you what's going on inside. Amuse yourselves, it won't be interesting for a second here. Yes, I just, thank you for the reminder that I moved the front tire. I wasn't going to put it right on the ground, but I appreciate you guys looking out for us.
Uh, does it run in four cylinder mode? The question is uh, not on purpose. Uh, if it's running in four cylinder mode, that's a bad sign. Um, actually, before I get to the active exhaust, I will mention the engine. One of the questions we have is why we don't use the newer LT1 engine. Um, the LT1 was brand new as a crate when we just started this particular project. We actually borrowed one from our local, uh, our local GM dealer, so we had an LT1 crate. At the time, though, it wasn't clear how much aftermarket was going to be available with it because it's direct injection, its packaging was a little bit funkier, and we had a bunch of parts already designed for the LS. We actually, um, we actually polled a bunch of our LS customers, cars that we'd actually built for, cars for, and asked them, what would you prefer, LS3, LS, uh, LT1? Uh, they all voted for the LS3. Um, we knew they also had the potential of a carb legal setup with that as well. Uh, at the time, there was no sign that was going to happen with the LT1, so we decided to go with the LS. It packaged a little bit better, um, and it gave us more future proofing at the time. Uh, we haven't really regretted that decision. Um, we think the, uh, the LS is still a very strong platform, still extremely well supported. Um, it would be nice if there was an LT variant, but uh, that was just not, not on the cards. Remember, this, this car was built in 2016. Um, the LT1 was very, very new at that time. So let's talk about the active exhaust. Let me get in the car here. Whoop! This is gonna be extreme close up action here. So, this. This is a control that doesn't do anything most of the time. Um, it's your wiper speed control for intermittent wipers. So, this was Colin's idea. We stole this control and we use it to control the exhaust system. Um, we do this on the four-cylinder cars as well. We, we've, this is something that has come out of the V8 development for the four-cylinder cars. Uh, this means that it runs in what we call quiet mode all the time. The mufflers are always engaged. Um, you will never go into full wide open noisy mode. That is full wide open noisy mode. Uh, switch to that and um, the car will make as much noise as it can. And then in the middle it will change over from one to the other at various throttle positions, position settings. So this one I forget the actual numbers. It's about 25, 20%. I think it's 25. That switches those over at 50. That switches over at 75. Or vice versa, actually. This switches over at 25. So basically, it takes a lot of throttle to make it go loud. It takes a medium amount of throttle. It takes a little throttle. Always loud. Uh, the accelerator pedal. Good, that's a good question, actually. Um, I will get to that, uh, Hugh. I will, I will talk about the accelerator pedal in a moment. But first, I'm in the car. I'm playing with uh, the noise thing. Let's make some noise. There we go. We also put this on as a joke when you first built this car. So there we go. We're in the quiet mode right now. At idle doesn't sound a lot different. But if I turn it to always loud, uh, you can hear the bass now. That's a fun trick. I gotta say, I love the sound. There we go. That's a fun trick. I love the sound of this car um, when it's in the full noisy mode because it really is like a musical instrument. You can control exactly when it opens up with how you use the throttle. Makes all sorts of crazy noises. Um, so, there you go. That is also how the, uh, the Hush-O-Matic works as well on the four-cylinder cars. It uses that same control um, just by twisting that, and that is technology that came out of the V8s for the four-cylinders. Um, as for, we had a question about what throttle pedal we used. Um, the GM wiring harness comes with a drive-by-wire throttle, which can be uh, retrofitted. That's what we do on the earlier chassis. On this chassis, we were able to figure out how to uh, we were able to figure out how to use the Mazda pedal. We did a little bit of rewiring. Um, right, let me get out of this thing. Not sure you can see it at all. We did a little bit of rewiring, but we were able to keep the Mazda pedal down there. Um, those uh, those pedal covers are available from Fly Miata. There you go. There's a there's a nice little product perch, and as you can see, there's there's a little bit of extra wiring. That's where the gateway's hidden. That's uh, R&D car, we yanked that thing out a fair bit. But yeah, that uses a factory um, factory Mazda pedal, which was really kind of nice, because it meant we didn't have to come up with a new mechanism for that thing. 
we do have to reinforce the clutch pedal because of the um, because of the the load of the of the Willwood uh, master cylinder of the heavier clutches in this car. Um, we did have to reinforce some parts that were engineered to be super cheap, super light, um, and deal with you know the 155 horsepower transmission that's in this car. So we do have to beef that up. There's a couple little extra pieces that go in there. Uh, emissions, that is a good question and a popular one. This car is not currently legal for use in California. Um, the engine swap regulations are such that it would be a challenge to do it. We may be able to get a special EO for it. Uh, there would be a lot of money involved in that, in, uh, in testing and making that work. But it may be possible to get it working with that, uh, with that EO, but it would require special testing. For other states, it's legal uh, in, the, in the majority of them. Um, to make it the most legal, we recommend using the E-Rod engine uh, because it has a few extra emissions testing, emissions monitoring uh, systems built into it. Um, you know, for example, it monitors the health of the cats. This car has cats, but it's not checking the cats. Um, so if you plug in an OBD2 reader, it won't return a big thumbs up saying, hey, your cats are working. Um, so we do recommend if you are concerned about emissions legality to use the E-Rod setup. Um, it should be legal in pretty much every state at that point, but we do recommend that you do check with your local DMV before you embark on this uh, adventure because you don't want to learn the hard way. Every state has its own rules in this regard. Um, and I, I cannot answer for every state. I can tell you for California that unfortunately, um, you can do it on a 95 Miata, but you can't do it on a 2016. I think I'm gonna have to go back to my notes here and see what questions people have asked. Give me a second, just enjoy the beautiful view of this car. Come on, open up. Sorry, working on getting my notes here. Okay, questions. Interesting discoveries that we made during development. <laughs> we did make some interesting develop, uh, discoveries. Did you know that the fuel pump changed on ND Miatas partway through the 2016 model year? Uh, this car is a very early one, and so it has the original fuel pump, or had, uh, which is not sufficient to support an ND V8. Um, the... Uh, the later cars, partly through the year, they switch to a monster pump. It will support a 575 horsepower V8 engine. Why? I have no idea. Thank you, Mazda, for making our lives very much easier when it comes to fuel systems. Uh, this car has been retrofitted with the later ND um, pump. And like I said, it was halfway through the year. I don't know what the heck they did it for, but um, yeah, thank you very, very much for that one, uh, for that one, Mazda. Um, Oh, Hugh asked about the ABS, and that is actually something I should continue with, because I started talking about the ABS. Uh, let me just put this guy down. Stay still. So I can actually look at you guys. Let me know if I'm not being loud enough. Okay, so ABS. We had trouble when we first built this car, the ABS randomly failing, going into a failure mode. Um, we could not figure it out. We did lug everything in the world. We had cars sitting there in our shop, monitored up factory ones, um, the V8 one, trying to find out what was talking to what, where the failure mode was, trying to find the one little thing. Uh, we, took a, we took our stock RF uh, and put one of the gateways in it so we could monitor things and block things and turn stuff off and try to piss off the ABS system. And what we found out was it was where we had put the gateway in the CAN system. Now see, CAN signals, it's network traffic. so things don't necessarily have to go from one to the other to another, it's a broadcast. This unit says, I have this piece of information, and then some other piece, some other unit might say, oh, hey, there we go, the ABS says that we're going 37 miles an hour, I'll tell the speedometer. So it's more like a series of broadcasts, and what was happening um, is that we had put our, our gateway in between the dynamic stability control module, aka the ABS, and the, um, the powertrain control module. And it was being told to just pass all the, all the messages straight through there, but there was this very infinitesimal delay in there. But on a very high demand, very high important um, signal like that, that little delay was enough to throw an error. So all we had to do was at the end of it, after all this programming and coding, 
was simply move that box somewhere else so that those two could talk directly to each other and then we could intercept all the messages before they got to the body control module and we could get the starter to work and the speedometer to work and the uh, tachometer to work and everything like that. So the ABS works 100% normally on this car now. Uh, now that we figured that out, now that we know that uh, that particular circuit was very, very critical for timing, even if we had it set to go straight through. But um, yeah, in the early days, we did have some problems with ABS. But you'll see a reference to that when Road and Track tested the car on track. Um, they did that 2017, I think. There's a great article by Sam Smith about driving this car on track at Laguna Seca. And that was when it was still having trouble with the ABS, and it falls on at least once. Um, but that problem's been solved for a couple of years. Uh, the fuel system is a, <laughs> basically it's stock Mazda at this point. It's not, it's uh, internally regulated, it's kind of old school actually. It's not, it's not messing with the pressure uh, the way it does on some of the other cars. This is just straightforward, set for 60 PSI, and, uh, and that's what the engine likes. So, there you go. Check some more questions. I'm going to keep talking until you guys stop asking questions, so. Okay, turnkey builds. Um, this is unfortunate, is that we, we did build these cars for customers. We built a few of them. Uh, they were built to be reproduced. Uh, like I said, you know, for example, the first intake system that we built for this car was made out of several pieces of silicone that were chopped together. Then we had a custom one built up so that we could simply take one off the shelf, plug it in. Um, And, and we did make them for car for customers. The problem was, is that it takes away one of our development engineers. Uh, when he's building these cars, he's not doing development. Um, and we did a lot of work on our internal systems a couple of years ago, or a year and a bit ago, to improve our efficiency as a, as a retailer. Um, you might remember we were having trouble getting parts out the door within a week. Um, our stock numbers were all jacked up. All sorts of stuff was just kind of funky. and. We were able to prove that dramatically. We can ship stuff the same day or next day now. Our stock numbers are 100% accurate on the website. Uh, but the problem is, is that the system we have in place to do that doesn't deal well with shop work. Uh, and also, we needed, we needed Kyle, who was our primary builder on this car, did a lot of the hands-on engineering. Um, we needed him doing R&D work for other for four-cylinder stuff, for other, other products. So it was a very sad decision to make to stop doing turnkeys, but unfortunately, it's a very different business from our normal day-to-day -day business. It was preventing us from doing our normal day-to-day -day as well as we would like. Uh, so unfortunately, we did discontinue the, uh, the builds. Um, instead, what we do offer is we offer the parts and we offer support. So if you want to build your own, you can do so. Um, we can, uh, we can supply you with the parts you need for that. We can supply you with uh, instructions on how to do that. We are still looking at options on how to bring turnkey cars back. Um, at the moment, we don't have a time for that. A uh, question from Chris Smith about the ECU. The ECU in this car is the one that comes with the GM crate engine system. So it's a GM ECU, um, heavily cracked. You can get into it with HP tuners and tweak it up all you want to. Um, and it is, it is integrated with the rest of the car with our MRS gateway. So, there we go. Sorry about that, just checking some comments. Um, so yeah, the ECU, it's kind of funny. We used as many off-the-shelf parts as we could, which means that if you pull into a GM dealership, uh, you will clear out the service bays. Everyone will come have a look at it. Everyone will laugh, they will love it, and then they will know exactly how to fix it. Um, if you're in Lancaster, California, and you have a failed power steering pump that takes out your power steering rack, the, uh, the Lancaster um, Chevy dealer will have the parts on the shelf. And I know that because I've tested it. So using things like the GM ECU means that there are a billion tuners out there who know how to deal with it, and, uh, and it's very well understood. All the error codes are understood. It makes it very easy to deal with. Um, we did have a question earlier about whether the car is tuned for power per gear. It is not. Uh, it is very easy to, to control the traction in this thing because it has such a linear power delivery. It has good traction uh, and lots of, lots of suspension travel, so we don't find any need to limit the power in lower gears. It does, it does very well. And, uh, and yes, the question, are RF V8 conversions a thing? There is one uh, at the moment. There is one, the guy is an honest to goodness amateur rocket scientist. He builds his own solid rocket booster motors. 
Um, fantastic guy to hang out with. He sends me pictures of his, uh, of his rocket tests on a regular basis. He's planning on twin turbos at some point, which is a little nuts. But yes, there is one RF. I got to tell you, if I was building one of these for myself, it would be a black RF because I love it. Uh, question from Jim Cordway about, sorry about the, the gimbals acting up a little bit, about putting a V6 in. We decided early on when we were doing conversions to concentrate on one conversion and to do it well. So instead of trying to put every possible engine and understand the platform as well as possible, we decided to understand V8 Miatas as well as possible, which means to do V6s properly, you need to change everything that you change in a V8, honestly. You need to change the rear end, the transmission, the front end. You don't really save all that effort. You give up 100 horsepower, and it's a completely new system in a lot of ways. The LFX engine has a lot in common with this one. Some of the stuff we've learned in this car would help with the LFX. But if you're gonna go to that effort, well, why don't you just put the V8 in in the first place? You know, you're not really saving, this thing doesn't, isn't front heavy. You're giving up a bunch of horsepower. Now, yeah, so we haven't really bothered. Uh, question about the power steering system and the rack, uh, which is good because that's, that's the sort of technical stuff I love talking about here. Um, the pump is off a of CTSV. The rack, as it turns out, is off a of Camaro. We didn't just go to Camaro for everything, but we did measure exactly how long the rack needed to be in order to prevent bump steer problems. Um, and the ND Miata actually uses a very wide rack. It's quite surprising. Uh, it's quite a bit wider than the 24-inch rack used on other Miatas. It's 30, 31 inches, something like that. And so we started looking through parts catalogs. Uh, GM is very supportive of builders. Uh, through SEMA, we can get CAD models of all sorts of stuff. And we found that uh, a specific Camaro rack um, fit. It, it, it suited our needs. And because it was a GM system, we were able to fine tune the pressures with the GM pump to get the, uh, the assist we need. We originally had it a little bit under assisted. Um, that, had some, uh, that had some bad side effects. We, we then bumped the assist a little bit. It's actually quite a light steering feel. Very similar to factory in a lot of ways. Uh, the tie rods are actually off a of Buick, of all things. Um, so yes, the V8 Miata has Buick parts uh, with custom adapters to fit them to the Miata spindles. Um, and we did spend a lot of time on bump steer to make sure that we didn't have any weird bump steer or Ackerman problems, and no one has ever really picked up on that, on the fact that we've changed the rack. So that's been a real plus. Uh, that steering rack was actually, actually a little bit of a challenge. It caused a lot of the can struggles as well, a lot of the, the can uh, difficulties we experienced, other than things like how to make the, uh, the fuel read properly, the steering rack was the source of a lot of them. Looking at notes. Does it feel like a factory car? It does. Honestly, that is my favorite comment from journalists, is they, they say that it feels like it came from the factory this way. You'll see it in road and track, you'll see it in automobile, you'll see it in car and driver. They talk about the, the organic feel of the car and how much it feels like a factory job. Um, I'm very proud of that. Uh, the whole Fly Me Out of team that worked on this car, uh, whoa, there's a Mini. Um, Kyle Tiger did, uh, as I said, a lot of the hands-on work. Um, Brandon Fitch did, uh, did a lot of the, the engineering drawing. Um, I did a lot of chassis setup. Everybody was involved at some point. I'm really happy with the, uh, with the work everyone's done. Just a second here, folks. I need to set something up. One phone battery here. Um, so question about an LS3 versus a fully optimized tuned BBR kit on the ND1. That's a question that was sent into us, actually. Um, they're very different cars. Uh, you know, the BBR feels like, <laughs> it actually feels, we often described as it feels like you take an ND and put a bigger engine in it, whereas this feels like a factory-built supercar. It's got that noise, it shakes at idle, this particular one in, in specifically, and uh, it is just, it's got an animal edge to it that you don't get with the turbo. The turbo is a very, very refined feel. Um, it's quick. Uh, it's very comfortable for cross-country driving. I've done 1,000-mile days on that as well. Um, but it doesn't have the, uh, the sheer punch in the back of the head that you get with this car. Shifting into the third or fourth gear in this car at full throttle is something everyone should experience. I literally have laughed out loud, you know, when I, I'm running through the gears. You hit third or you hit fourth on the track, and your head literally bounces off the headrest. You have to laugh. There's no other way around it. 
Um, we had a couple of cooling questions. Uh, Cooling has actually been very, very good. We don't have problems keeping this engine cool. Uh, the biggest reason is because the LS3 is a very, very efficient engine cooling-wise. And uh, we put a, I can't remember if it's a dual pass or a triple pass. I think this is a triple pass um, cross-flow radiator in these things with a set of fans designed specifically for this car. Uh, so you can't see it. That is the nature of an ND radiator. It's invisible. Um, but there is a custom radiator back there. We do not have cooling problems with this car. It, uh, it cools extremely well. Uh, question about the feel of the different engines. Does the factory LS3 feel more factory? It does. Um, it idles like a factory car. This car, as you may have heard, it shakes at idle. Um, it has a whomp, 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 whomp noise, which is, I'm a child. I love it. Uh, but it is not as smooth. The LS3, the standard LS3, feels like a, like a factory car. And we do have... We have folks at Flying Miata who prefer each one. Um, I like my V8 cars with a little bit of crazy. Uh, some people like their V8 cars with basically Corvettes with 1,000 pound weight loss. So take your, uh, take your pick. I, the the uh, 525 is a little, uh, little more in your face, which may, or be, may be good, may be bad. I know that Jeremy Ferber, his favorite is a stock LS3 in an NC. He loves, uh, he loves that, that standard setup. Uh, okay, I am actually running low on foam battery of all things. Um, there are reasons. But uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. I'm going to have to shut this down before too long. I'm looking to see if I have any more questions. Uh, will a Coyote fit? Probably not. Um, coyotes are physically huge engines. They are dual overhead cam. And as you can see, there isn't a lot of extra room in here, and a coyote has heads that come out to here. So I'm not going to say impossible, because, you know, there's theoretically a Hellcat that's sort of in a Miata, but do you want to be able to close the hood all the way when you're done? No, unfortunately, it's not going to work. Not unless you are literally going to put wheels on the bottom of the oil pan. Um, questions about variants? Let's see. I think I've answered all of the really good questions here. Uh, DIY kits, if you, wanted to, or if you want to do it yourself and all that trouble we had with the can, that is no longer a problem because we can sell the MRS gateway to you pre-programmed and you literally at that point just plug it in. Um, so it's, uh, it's actually all of that work that we did to make the, um, to make the can system work will work for you. Uh, John's asking about the headers. Uh, the firewall is actually almost untouched. Um, we had one space right near the throttle pedal. We had to give it a little bump. But the headers were designed specifically for this uh, swap. They're inch and three-quarter primary, I think. Uh, very nice header, actually, made for us by PPE. But they were designed specifically for, on this car, for the, uh, for the V8 NDs. So there is, it's tight, but there is no modification required to make that work. There's almost no welding required on this swap at all. Um, it's very close to a plug-in. It's actually the easiest of the swaps to, uh, to do, but it required the most work electrically. Uh, the oil pan is the same oil pan that we sell for all, uh, all of our V8 conversions. It's made for us by Moroso. It has an extreme amount of clearance at the front for uh, steering racks. Um, it has very good oil control uh, with baffles, uh, hinged baffles around the oil pickup so you don't have the, uh, the oil starvation problem that you, uh, that you often have with these things. So we will, uh, we will be putting this, did we seam weld the vehicle? Um, okay, so this particular car, we don't seam weld the NDs. They're aw awfully stiff to begin with. Uh, we don't put any extra reinforcement on the front end because we have not found that this one particularly needs it. Uh, we did, I showed earlier in the video, if you're watching this live and you missed it, you can rewind later. Um, we do have a special brace underneath, we call the spider brace, that does stiffen up the center of the car. Um, but this is a very stiff car from the factory, so uh, we, we have not, um, we've not had to do any supplemental reinforcement to it. You have to remember that the NA and NB chassis were effectively designed in the mid-80s with what the tools were there at the time. This was designed with modern technology in eh, 20, I'm going to guess 2015, 2014, well, probably 2014 or so. So it's a much, much stiffer chassis to start with. Uh, question about miles per tank of fuel. Uh, this one problem with the ND is they do have a fairly small tank. It's only about 10 gallons. Um, 
I've never tried to stretch it out all the way. You could probably get 300 miles on the highway if you were willing to take the chance of coasting into the next gas station. Um, generally speaking, this is, uh, you know, for a cross-country car, it works pretty well. Um, but uh, if you are, if, if you don't like going to the gas station, this may not be a great car for you, especially if you're driving around town. So I think just because I'm getting close to the end of battery here, I don't know if I can see what my current battery level is. Um, I think I'm going to call this. We are going to put this video on YouTube, so feel free to ask questions in the comments on YouTube. We will answer them. Uh, we'll have it on our Facebook uh, page as well. You can ask questions there. Um, oh, my favorite question I had is, can you marry it? Well, you know, you can't register it in California, but if there's any state in the, in the country where you could marry this thing, California would probably be the state that would let you marry a car. So I will let you work on your own, uh, work on your own state legislatures about that. Um, we do not, uh, we do not con condone nor do we deny, I guess. Uh, recommend against this particular behavior. If you want to marry your car, you go right ahead. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I, think that's, uh, I think that's about it. We do offer the parts to do this at the moment. If you, uh, if you want to build your own, um, we have some folks who have built theirs. Um, I think I've covered pretty much all of the, uh, all the questions we've had. Any last minute questions before I shut this down? Get typing, um, put them in here right now. Otherwise, I will fire this car up one more time just because that's the thing you got to do. So here we go. Stand still there. This gimbal likes to move. Okay. If this is a really popular video, if we have a lot of questions that pop up afterwards, we may be able to do a part two. So if you do have questions that weren't answered, um, hit us up and we'll uh, you know, put them in the, quest in the comments. We may do another video, but first, let's make some noise. Here we go. You gotta love a car that shakes on its springs at idle, don't you? A uh, question about from Jim about uh, emissions, Jim. That has been answered already. I won't. Uh, I won't go it again. But basically, no, not carb legal. Um, we are not currently doing emissions costs or emission. Or sorry, we're not currently doing turnkey swaps. So I cannot answer the question about costs. Um, if you build one yourself, it's going to depend on where you source a lot of the parts. If you use a junkyard engine, or sorry, previously enjoyed engine, it will be less expensive than if you buy a crate. Um, but we are, not, uh, we are not currently doing swaps, so we cannot, I cannot cost on what it will cost you because it will cost everybody something different. All right. So, thanks for your attention, folks. Um, this has been the technical tour of the NDV8. And uh, we will see you again next week with another Facebook Live. I don't know the subject of that one yet, but, uh, but we'll get there. And again, if you have questions, if you're watching this after the fact, please hit us up with comments and questions. We'll be happy to answer them. And uh, if you want to see more of this car in action, um, have a look at the Flamietta page. There's a link on there for media, and you'll see the smoking tire has driven this thing. You'll see uh, Drive Tribe, a number of different uh, companies, different groups, have done actual uh, actual video test and even even NBC Sports on proving grounds uh, they they tested the car and I got to tell you it was faster than McLaren around their test track so thank you very much folks my name is Keith Tanner and we will see you next week. <laughs>